Good afternoon. My name is Devin, and I will be your conference operator today. I would like to welcome everyone to the KB Home 2020 First Quarter Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Following the company's opening remarks, we will open the lines for questions. Today's conference call is being recorded and will be available for replay at the company's website at kbhome.com through April 26. Now, I would like to turn the call over to Joe Peters, Senior Vice President, Investor Relations. Joe, thank you. You may begin. Thank you, Devin. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today to review our results for the first quarter of fiscal 2020. On the call are Jeff Mesger, Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer, Matt Mandino, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer, Jeff Kaminsky, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, Bill Hollinger, Senior Vice President and Chief Accounting Officer, and Thad Johnson, Senior Vice President and Treasurer. Before we begin, let me note that during this call, items will be discussed that are considered forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. These statements are not guarantees of future results, and the company does not undertake any obligation to update them. Due to factors outside of the company's control, including those detailed in today's press release and in filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, Actual results could be materially different from those stated or implied in the forward-looking statements. In addition, a reconciliation of the non-GAAP measures referenced during today's discussion to their most directly comparable GAAP measures can be found in today's press release and or on the Investor Relations page of our website at kbhome.com. And with that, I will turn the call over to Jeff Mesker. Thank you, Jill, and good afternoon, everyone. We are finding creative ways to adapt to changing conditions as the country deals with the COVID-19 outbreak. While Jeff and I are in the office today practicing social distancing, the rest of our team is on this call from different locations. These are unprecedented times, and our main priority continues to be the health and well-being of our community of employees, customers, and business partners, and their families. While we are reporting excellent first quarter results today that showed strong momentum across our footprint, given current market conditions, we are withdrawing our guidance for this year. Rather than follow our standard approach for these quarterly earnings calls, my remarks today will focus on how we are responding to the COVID-19 related challenges, the actions we are taking to navigate this uncertain environment, and the strength of our positioning to manage through it. We began the process early last week of temporarily closing our sales centers, model homes, and design studios to the general public. During this time, we have shifted to appointment only, following appropriate protocols to help ensure the health and safety of our employees and customers. We're also leveraging our virtual sales tools, including home video tours, interactive floor plans, and an online design studio to give customers the ability to shop for a new home from the comfort and safety of their mobile device or personal computer. In addition, we are also actively engaging with customers by phone, email, FaceTime, Skype, and other online tools. We are seeing an increased response to our digital efforts. Month to date in March, Visits to our website are up nearly 50%, and conversions to sales leads are up over 20%, both as compared to their respective prior year periods. In addition to the temporary changes we have made at our communities, we have also shifted our corporate and division office functions to working remotely. We will continue to monitor the situation and follow the guidance of the center's for disease control and prevention, as well as state and local authorities. In most of our markets, there are restrictions on activities, commonly called shelter-in-place orders, but these orders usually exempt residential construction, categorizing it as an essential activity. Our company is better positioned than perhaps we have ever been to deal with this type of disruption. 
the tremendous progress we made over the past three years under our return focused growth plan has truly transformed KB Home. We are now a larger, more profitable company with a higher gross margin supported by a solid balance sheet which has no goodwill and over $1.2 billion in liquidity. Our leverage ratio has steadily improved in the past few years and continued to progress in the first quarter, both year over year and relative to year end 2019. In addition, we have a better mix of assets as a result of both our discipline and acquiring land, as well as the ongoing reduction in our inactive inventory. Our approach to land acquisition has primarily focused on communities that provide a roughly one to two year supply of lots in preferred submarkets with price points that are attainable by the median household income. Our lots owned at the end of the first quarter represented a 3.1 year supply based on our last 12 months of deliveries. In these challenging times, housing is an even more essential need as home buyers want a place of their own for many reasons, including safety, security, and health. Throughout the first quarter, low mortgage interest rates and a strong economy, together with limited resale inventory, fueled home buyer interest. And demand held steady for the first two weeks of March, with our net orders up 7% relative to the comparable prior year period. As news of the coronavirus intensified and we temporarily closed our sales centers, as I mentioned earlier, traffic and sales slowed in the third week of March with net orders now down a cumulative 5% quarter to date as compared to the prior year period. Our cancellation rate is currently healthy at 17% quarter to date, although both our order and cancellation rates could change as we go forward depending on how conditions evolve from here. With our built order business model, our buyers are vested in their purchases when we start their home, given the time they have devoted to selecting their lot, floor plan, and structural options, then personalizing their home in our design studios, along with obtaining mortgage approval. We believe this process helps to reduce our risk of cancellations after start. At the end of the first quarter, our backlog increased year over year to 5,821 homes with a value of $2.1 billion, up 28% relative to the prior year period. We remain in regular contact with our buyers in backlog, and with its high capture rate, KBHS, our mortgage services JV, gives us both an additional avenue to support and communicate with our customers as well as better predictability to manage through the closing process. Operationally, the built-to-order model allows us to align our business to demand and build to our sales pace and not to a targeted delivery goal, minimizing our spec starts and mitigating inventory risk. Under this model, we also scale our land acquisition and development spend to sales. In addition, having already rotated our product offerings down in square footage to promote affordability, we have expanded the choices that buyers have in our communities. Our long-tenured leadership team has successfully managed the company through a variety of economic cycles. One of the many benefits of experience is learning to quickly adapt to changing market conditions. Given the uncertainty surrounding the duration and extent to which COVID-19 will impact the U.S. housing market, we are focused on being both prudent and strategic with our cash resources. We continue to close homes with our quarter-to-date deliveries ahead of the comparable period of last year, providing us with cash inflows, and we are closely monitoring cash outflows. As such, we have curtailed land acquisition and land development for now. This public health crisis has interrupted many businesses and government services, and we have found land sellers and developers to generally be accommodating in extending closing dates. 
We are also shifting to more targeted phases of land development aligned to our sales pace. We have long-standing relationships with many of our land sellers and developers, and we are working collaboratively with them to carefully and thoughtfully manage our business. In closing, we had an excellent first quarter, and demand remained resilient in the early weeks of our second quarter. Although these data points are in the rearview mirror, they do provide a good sense of the strength of our business and the strong desire for home ownership. We believe we are well positioned with a solid balance sheet, strong liquidity, and an experienced leadership team that is communicating daily across our organization to ensure that we are focused on the right priorities with consistency. In addition, we have an effective core business strategy and a built-to-order model that provides flexibility and mitigates risk. I would like to thank all of our employees for their dedication to KB Home and determination to support our customers and each other. I also want to thank our trade partners who have responded to the call from our company and our industry colleagues to participate in a national campaign under the hashtag Builders Care by contributing protective masks and eyewear for our heroic healthcare workers across the country who desperately need these supplies. I'm confident in our team's ability to lead our company through this period of uncertainty. We look forward to the eventual stabilization of market conditions and updating you on our progress along the way. With that, I'll now turn the call over to Jeff for the financial review. Jeff. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. I will now briefly cover highlights of our financial and operational performance for the first quarter, followed by comments summarizing the strength of our significantly improved financial position and the solid liquidity supporting our planned strategies to navigate through these uncertain times. The abbreviated summary of our outstanding first quarter performance is a strong reminder of how well we have continued to execute our differentiated strategy. This same strategy and level of execution drove the tremendous improvements in our profitability, returns, financial position, liquidity, and capital structure generated under the Returns Focused Growth Plan we launched in 2016. Our performance during the first quarter and for the past several years gives me great confidence in our ability to execute during this market disruption. During the first quarter, we generated improvements in virtually all of our key profitability measures and ended the quarter with a robust balance sheet and solid liquidity. In short, it was a very strong quarter of financial performance for the company. Our first quarter housing revenues were up 34% from a year ago to $1.1 billion, reflecting a 28% increase in homes delivered and a 5% rise in overall average selling price. Housing revenues were favorably impacted by our sizable backlog at the beginning of the quarter, which was up 24% year over year, as well as strong market conditions and outstanding execution throughout the quarter, with several of our divisions significantly outperforming forecasts and delivery results. Home building operating income of $60.2 million for the quarter increased 92% year over year from $31.3 million and our operating margin rose 170 basis points to 5.6%. Our housing gross profit margin improved 30 basis points to 17.4%, including total inventory-related charges of $5.7 million in the 2020 quarter and $3.6 million in the year earlier period. Excluding the impact of inventory-related charges, our gross margin for the quarter was 17.9%, compared to 17.6% for the prior year quarter. This improvement reflected the favorable impacts of increased operating leverage due to higher housing revenues and lower amortization of previously capitalized interests. These favorable impacts were partly offset by a shift in the mix of homes delivered toward communities with lower gross profit margins. Our selling general administrative expense ratio of 11.8% improved by 160 basis points from last year's first quarter ratio, mainly as a result of the increased operating leverage from higher housing revenues and our continued focus on cost containment. 
Our net income for the quarter was up 99% year over year to $59.7 million, and diluted earnings per share more than doubled to 63 cents. We ended the quarter with stockholders' equity of over $2.4 billion and book value per share of $27. Against this backdrop of our strong first quarter performance, I will now provide an overview of our current financial position. During last quarter's earnings call, we described several initiatives that contributed to the success of our returns-focused growth plan in achieving our capital allocation and efficiency objectives and improving our financial risk profile. These included measurably growing our total inventory investment while reducing our inactive inventory, substantially deleveraging our capital structure, and meaningfully expanding the borrowing capacity under our revolving credit facility. We obviously appreciate even more the significant progress we made in these areas given the current uncertain market environment. We believe our strength in financial position and liquidity profile produced through our focus execution of these initiatives will provide financial flexibility and support our ability to capitalize on opportunities as we operate through this period of uncertainty. At the end of the first quarter, our leverage ratio of 41.7% improved another 60 basis points from the end of our 2019 fiscal year. Our net debt to capital ratio finished the quarter at just over 35%. In addition to the favorable impact on our leverage ratio, the refinancing activities completed in 2019 lowered the expected amount of incurred interest in 2020 by nearly $14 million and extended the weighted average life of our senior note to just under five years as of the end of the first quarter. In January 2020, Standard & Poor's Financial Services upgraded our credit rating to double B from double B minus and changed the rating outlook to stable from positive. We ended the first quarter with $430 million of cash and total liquidity of over $1.2 billion, including available capacity under our unsecured revolving credit facility. In addition, we had no outstanding borrowings under our revolver at any point during the first quarter, and we do not have any senior note maturities until December 2021. As we previously reported, we completed an amendment to our credit facility in the 2019 fourth quarter, increasing its borrowing capacity to $800 million from $500 million and extending its maturity by more than two years to October 2023. Given the current macro environment, we are pleased with the additional financial flexibility available to us with this enhanced liquidity. During the first quarter, after investing $405 million in land and land development, we utilized only $10 million of net operating cash. We have consistently generated positive net operating cash flow in each year since 2015, while funding an average annual land investment in excess of $1.4 billion over that period. Our ability to efficiently and effectively react to changes in the market environment and control our level of land investment is a significant lever available to us as we manage liquidity. We expect to continue to make selective investments as we implement the land-related actions Jeff outlined earlier. In conclusion, as this unprecedented health crisis continues to evolve, we believe we are well prepared to navigate through this volatile period. We also believe that the combined strength of our built-to-order business model consistent operational execution, and focus on offering affordable products will enable us to capitalize on the eventual return of more normalized market activity. Our financial position and liquidity profile are stronger today than at any point over the past decade, and we are proud of the many successful initiatives we have implemented to reduce our financial risk and enhance the quality of our balance sheet. We will now take your questions. Devin, uh, please open the lines. Thank you. At this time, we will be conducting a question and answer session. During this time, we ask that you limit yourself to one main question and one follow-up. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. Our first, our first question comes from the line of Alan Ratner with Zellman & Associates. 
please do with your question. Hey guys, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the, the time and I uh, hope you're all doing well and the team is doing well uh, in addition. Um, you know, first, uh, I guess, um, questions here, just digging in. I, I'm thinking about the backlog, the 5,800 homes there. I was curious if you could just talk a little bit about that. Obviously, a, a lot of focus on getting those homes delivered, and it, it's encouraging to hear March closings up year over year. Can you talk a little bit about maybe the percentage of that backlog that was scheduled to deliver in the upcoming quarter and, and kind of what steps you're taking with those buyers and backlog to to help, hopefully facilitate them getting to the uh, the closing line there. And on the homes that are newer, maybe haven't been started yet, are you doing anything differently there as far as, uh, you know, maybe putting off uh, starting those homes or, or any anything along those lines that might be uh, might be mitigating some of the, the potential cancellation risk in the future? Sure. There's a lot of questions, Alan. I'll, I'll uh, do my best to really just give you a state of play and how we, we manage our backlog, as you know. Our backlogs typically uh, five to five and a half month supply of deliveries, and a portion of that is in the unstarted bucket, and the rest is scattered through from foundation to final. And we try to get into a rhythm of of uh, even flow deliveries, monitoring the the backlog and the starts. A uh, couple things for you: we, we are continuing to complete homes, and as I shared, our March closings are ahead of last year. The title companies, the mortgage companies, escrow companies, city finals, everyone's finding ways to creatively accomplish their task along the way. And um, one thing I tried to communicate in my prepared comments, the buyers definitely want to close. We have a very motivated buyer right now that values home ownership and the safety and the security that goes with it. We, because of the protocol, and the uh, social distancing, there's fewer subs working in the homes today. So we, we are expecting that our, as we get deeper into the production cycle, build times will extend a little bit in that you can't have three or four different contractors in the home at, at any one time. And we're working right now to, to spread out the, the production width so that we don't have these, these chunks where you're just stuck because you don't have the capacity with the subs being spread out. And so we're, we're extending out the whip cycle. Uh, right now we're uh, closing homes that we're all within 30 days of completion on, on March 1, and that'll be the, the first priority. And as we extend it out a little bit, then we'll, we will follow that up on the uh, start side with the unstarted backlog, all of that predicated on the quality of the backlog and what are the conditions that uh, uh, we're seeing on the ground frankly, in each city. The cities all have a different story right now on what kind of shutdowns they have, how the economy is working, how the uh, COVID-19 cases are, what level there are and how it's impacting things. So very fluid. It's a uh, daily focus. And uh, right now, our backlog is pretty stable. Great. I appreciate that. Uh, that's very helpful. Um, Related to this, I guess, but um, you know, the mortgage market—that's uh, obviously very important. Getting those homes closed. It seems like there's a lot of kind of turmoil going on, especially in the secondary market and the servicing side of things. And I'm not sure if that's impacting your buyer's ability to get loans. But you know, we have heard some originators are actually putting in some overlays to to kind of mitigate their risk in terms of selling the loan. So just curious if you could talk about. I know it's changing every day, but. Um, how, how is the mortgage market right now in terms of uh, your ability to get loans closed? Um, we're, we're closing homes, so it's not an issue today. There's been some nibbling around the edges with uh, whether it's the, uh, uh, the investors or the servicers or the, the uh, equity line at the mortgage company where there's little requirements that are being introduced. None of them on their own a, a game changer, so we're, we're continuing to operate. It's great to have a business partner that's performing with Stearns. And as you've seen, the Fed is absolutely committed to ensuring liquidity in the mortgage market. So they're very active buying, buying mortgage-backed securities on a daily basis. The number I saw for yesterday was $50 billion in one day. So there's a lot of liquidity. Um, and the, the process is working pretty well for us. not an issue today. Great. Good luck to everybody. Thank you. Our next question comes to the line of 
It's from Lynn Patterson with Wells Fargo. Please see with your question. Hi, good afternoon, guys, and uh, thanks for taking my questions. Um, first, wanted to start off, uh, thanks for giving more March order trends. Um, you know, we've heard from contacts that orders have stayed fairly elevated due to, you know, prior backlog and prior contacts. But, you know, looking more near term, and maybe I'm splitting hairs, but could you maybe parse out how traffic uh, has actually trended in the past couple weeks, um, you know, on a year-over-year -year basis? Um, yeah, it's hard to hard to comp that, Truman, because we closed our sales offices last week. So any any walk-in traffic we may have seen, we we didn't want to see to keep our employees safe. We'd love to see them in the right uh, conditions, but we we shut our doors last week. So the the traffic and the leads that we're working right now are all internet-based and by appointment only. Once we get past the internet process and our on the internet side, things are are doing fine. I, I shared we're we're up year over year on internet leads, but we close the doors to the walk-in traffic. Any any way you could net those out between you know the the walk-in traffic and the internet traffic? Um, I mean, it's really hard to because it's, it's okay. And all that hard thing okay. To, to. Um. Uh, and then, you know, positive you all are, are uh, managing your, your cash flows. Um, could you just discuss how you're pulling back on the land spend? Are you rotating more toward option land? Are you delaying the land closing dates to purchase, or, or are you just really pulling back on own land altogether? Uh, good question, Truman. You know, for, for starters, I, I, for all the questions we get, I, I just want to remind everybody it's very fluid, and this hasn't been around that long. If you think our uh, earnings release we just put out was based on results that ended 25 days ago. So we're, we're 25 days past the end of a very successful quarter and now navigating through all this, this disruption. And our, our view right now has been to buy time. Um, we're not going to people and negotiating discounts. We're not doing anything like that. It's let's all work on this and buy some time And in the in the process, we've curtailed spend on entitlements, which can add up to a lot of money across the system. In many cities, they've, they've uh, canceled the public hearings in the short run. So it was, why spend money on an engineer if you can't get a map approved? So we, we've stopped all that. We're, we're uh, continuing to poke around on the land search side, but right now we'll be a little more uh, cautious with commitments. And we're working with our partners on land selling and the land developers, let's just pause, give us some time, and let's see how things settle out over the next 60 days. That's our primary focus right now. Through that process, you're going to spend less on land in the next 60 days. Our next question comes to the line of Mike Dahl with RBC Capital. Please do with your question. Hi, thanks for taking my questions, and first and foremost, hope that you all and your teams are staying safe and healthy. Uh, and it's good to see you taking a uh, proactive approach here. Um, I, I guess I, I just wanted to ask first a, a little more detail about how you are approaching the appointment process when it comes to new sales, because you know on your website it simply says that things are temporary, temporarily closed, but it sounds like you know maybe you're funneling then internet leads into still some some in-person visits. Uh, to the sales center, but uh, can you just walk us through that a little more? What is the process to get someone into uh, a model home at this point for an in-person visit? And uh, and likewise, it, you know, give us a little insight into then the design center phase, which ends up being you know, pretty crucial to your closing process. Sure. sure. And what, what we're already finding, Mike, is this is making us a better company and that we're testing our, our brains on virtual selling and the internet far more than we did a couple of months ago. And the buyer is responding. It's also changing the buyer's thought process on what it takes to, to uh, uh, acquire a home or go through the personalization process. So we're, we've closed our sales offices to walk-in traffic. Our first priority is the safety of, of our employees and in turn our customers. So we're compliant with everything. And we thought we'd move quick and close 
to uh, walk in traffic. Past that, um, if we have a sales office with two sales consultants in it, they are actively working remote right now through all the virtual tools we have, the online tools, communicating with people, demonstrating product, and uh, uh, our criteria is if you get through all that and uh, the buyer expresses an interest in visiting the model park and our sales team in that location is comfortable giving them a private tour, just the, the, that group, and they comply with all the CDC protocol, we'll go ahead and show them the models. And that's what we have in place across the system. So you, we have a, you know, the, all, all those have to align, and then we'll, we'll open up the models and show it to them. Interestingly, on the studio side, people are very comfortable making their selections online. We, we actually finaled in our studios last week 225 buyers last week that went through the process, and we're finding things we can do along the way, like our uh, carpet uh, supplier, great partner in Shaw, is willing to ship them, uh, each of our buyers, carpet samples of what they selected and ship them out quickly so they can, uh, from wherever uh, the samples get shipped to, we're bringing it to them for the choice as opposed to uh, them coming to us. So there, there's a lot of things like this going on right now, but the, the studios are functioning well in a remote process. Okay, that, that's really helpful. And then my second question, you know, you've, you've mentioned a handful of times now how fluid it is, and, and I think we all understand that. Um, with respect to the shelter-in-place orders, it, it's good that initially, um, you know, largely construction's been exempt, but we've heard, you know, a couple instances where um, construction is initially exempt, but then there's some, um, you know, some question of, you know, whether or not there's been some, uh, some shift in that where, uh, areas are going to look, re rethink construction and whether that should be exempt and, and then, um, you know, what specific activities, uh, would be considered part of that, i.e. the, um, the, the in-person appointments, which, which I think you mentioned is subject to all the other criteria. So ha have you seen any large markets that have initially kind of exempt construction, but now you're hearing that may end up being more restrictive? Uh, yeah, uh, Mike, as, as you touched on and I have, it, it is very fluid. And unfortunately, this process, in many cases, the whether it's a state order, a city order, or the federal order, are not clearly written. So there's a lot of interpretation. And as the, the order comes down from the, the governors to the mayors or the county commissioners, it's all subject to uh, somebody's interpretation and the way the bills are written. So there's, there's cities where the order would come out and we would interpret the order as you can't work, then uh, our industry would work with that uh, governmental entity and they would clarify it and know it's okay, you can go to work. There's others where we thought it said you could work and they've come out and said, no, you can't work. And as we're sitting on this call, and this is, uh, you know, moving around by the hour, as we sit on this call right now, uh, Seattle Metro, King County, as of Friday is shut down to construction. And they've uh, made the decision there that, um, it's not an essential business. For us, Seattle's not a very big part of our business, so we, we'd like to see it open so we can continue to advance our, our progress there, and we're doing well in Seattle, but as of Friday night, Seattle's closed down. If you go over to Texas, there's some confusion in Austin where the mayor has come out and uh, written a, a guideline where construction would not be an essential business unless it's for affordable housing or government housing. And uh, we're working with the mayor, we the industry, working with the mayor and the governor to try to get clarity there. And does it apply to the city of Austin or all of Travis County or all of Metro Austin? And there's a lot of confusion in the system. Other than those two, I'm not aware of anything where there's a conflict today. Uh, we're, we're open for business. Here in the state of California, there, if you can actually read the rules and it would suggest even to the uh, customer that it's okay to go visit a uh, community because it's an essential business. So 
So it's, it's pretty varied out there, but other than my two anecdotes on Austin and Seattle, uh, everything else is uh, operating today. Our next question comes to the line of Stephen Kim with Evercore ISI. Please shoot with your question. Thanks, thanks very much, guys. Uh, obviously, uh, very unusual times. And I was really, my question uh, relates to how you're adjusting uh, your the way you're going to be managing uh, things at the community level, specifically with respect to pricing uh, in this kind of uh, highly unusual time. Now, in your case, because you've shut down you know, your sales centers and, and that sort of thing, maybe the answer is a two-stage answer. Uh, but my question is effectively, uh, this demand drop-off is not really tied to price. Uh, but typically, you know, when sales slow down, division presidents modulate price and discounts to maintain a certain level of pace. I mean, that's just the way the business kind of runs. And uh, in this scenario, and as you move forward and hopefully get to a more normalized environment, but still with the probably some lingering effects of COVID on your traffic and sales, are you going to continue to uh, leave the pricing decisions up to the division presidents, or are you – preparing to, are you doing now, or are you preparing to um, uh, address pricing uh, with a little bit more of a centralized, in a little bit more of a centralized manner to, so that you don't, so you don't have price cuts or increased discounts, uh, which, uh, you know, would be done to try to raise uh, traffic or volumes when that's not really the issue, keeping volumes down? Um. Uh, Stephen, that's a, a good question, and you're, you're absolutely right. This it is different right now. We're we're not uh, slowing down in demand because of subprime mortgages or a pop in pricing or lack of demand or anything like that. It's uh, this, this terrible pandemic and then a, a government decision. And I, I guess it would depend on the the duration. Right now, in the short run. We're taking the view that we have a nice backlog to continue to generate revenue out of. We don't have a lot of inventory out there to go, quote, liquidate. So uh, we don't see an urgency to go do anything with price today. Uh, if anything, the inventory has got a higher value today if there's people out there that want to move into a home very quickly because of these, uh, the, for the health and the safety and the security I've, I've talked about. So our our view right now is uh, let's take our time, wait until there's clarity, continue to uh, sell homes like we are, um, continue to mine our backlog for deliveries, which we are, and depending on how things settle in each market, we'll revisit it. But uh, unless this thing was is really extended, I don't see major price moves here. I think this is more timing in the, the quality of the process with the customer. Yeah, that's uh, that's encouraging, and certainly we don't we, we certainly haven't heard of anything uh, suggesting that pricing industry wide is has been weakening, um, and so that's good to hear. Now you you've said that cancellation rates have held steady, buyers are motivated to close, assuming that's because in part they see that pricing is uh, you know holding steady. My quest, my second question relates to how this may play out in terms of the existing home market influencing the new home market. Typically, the existing home market and the new home market tend to move you know, somewhat together since they're both tied to similar economic factors and consumer confidence and all that. But today's different. The new market, uh, the new residential construction market, is much better equipped, in my view, to deal with social distancing than the resale market. And it looks like, I mean, certainly uh, it, this could continue to depress existing home transactions and be a problem in the resale market, much more so than the new market. Uh, so are you concerned and are you uh, preparing in any way to educate your DPs or your buyers uh, that uh, to not be reactive if you see pricing from folks in the resale market who really do need to sell? cutting their prices, uh, are you worried at all about that bleeding over into the new market, uh, or do you think that there's an ability to keep that separation, and keep that, if you will, somewhat quarantined to the resale market while the new market is able to retain pricing? Uh, 
I'll, I'll actually add another one, Steve. I think you're going to see a shortage of listings because you have people that are content with the safety and security of their existing home. You know, I, I think you'll see with whenever this settles and goes back in the other direction, I think you'll see a tighter resale market than you have even today because people aren't necessarily putting their home on the market. And on the other side, we're we're doing what we can to maintain the infrastructure and the subcontractor base and the momentum we have so that whenever it settles, we can move quickly. I'm I'm in the industry and I'm an optimist about being a home builder, but but I'm expecting when you get out the other side of this, it's going to be strong demand and people really wanting to own their own home. So we want to be ready for that. Our next question comes from the line of Buckhorn with Raymond James. Please see with your question. Hey, thanks. Good afternoon. I um, wanted to first ask about the supply chain and just see if you see anything on the horizon, whether it's imported materials, from China or, or other markets, anything that could be disruptive in terms of uh, continuing to the cadence of home closings that, that uh, may or may not extend out here in the coming weeks? Yep, uh, Buck, we're not seeing any disruption right now. When this thing first hit in China and the ports were closed and they didn't have trucks to, to move the product to the ports and all that, we quickly mobilized with all of our suppliers to understand their pipeline and their product availability, and and uh, many of them have more than even a year of supply of their product. So we didn't see any real signals that the supply chain was going to be too tight, and um, that's certainly how it's playing out for us today. We're not seeing any issues whatsoever. If anything, if you think about it with the the drop in Chinese demand for products that may even help the availability here in the, the U.S. right now. Um, another sound bite, and we'll see how it plays out. As, as uh, China's growth stopped, their demand for lumber stopped with it, and the Canadian uh, lumber markets have a lot of inventory right now. So that pressure that we saw in lumber that was occurring in the first couple months of this year that actually end up going the other way due to the inventory that's building up right now. So it's as fluid as everything else we're dealing with, but right now we're we're not seeing any real cost pressure on supply in the last month, and uh, the product is readily available. Great. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, and second one, um, if you could parse out maybe, I know this is the first few weeks of, of March, so it's small sample size, but I'm just wondering if within your communities, if you went down price point, we we're just hearing that the entry level communities that are the further down price point seem to be holding up much better through the early weeks of this crisis, that there's still a lot of more uh, demand um, and maybe even uh, a sense of urgency among multifamily renters in particular, uh, particularly trying to, to exit certain communities where they may or may not feel quite as safe in that type of environment, want to get a single family house of their own for security reasons. Um, have you detected anything like that or, or have any corroborating evidence that the entry level is doing better like that? Well, I, I do think it is. We, we really didn't comment on it in our uh, prepared remarks, but our first time buyer percentage did pick up in the first quarter. We're now 57% of our delivery, so it's, it's slightly higher than it was. I say that because it's always been a big part of our business, and um, it, it could speak to why our sales have held steady in uh, March. And I, I was uh, observing the other day to somebody here in the office, if I'm living in a one of those um, semi-downtown towers with a common hallway with 20 other renters, I'd much rather be in my own home in the suburbs right now. And I, I think I think we will see more of that going forward. All right, thanks. Congratulations. Our next question comes on the line of Matthew Boulet with Barclays. Please see with your question. Hey, uh, good afternoon, and, um, you know, thanks, everyone, for all the details through this. Um, I, I wanted to ask on the traffic side again, you know, just that strength in, in website traffic and lead conversion, you know, presumably a lot of that is, is just replacing the in-person traffic, but is there any scenario where you might consider building any more spec to perhaps have some product available 
uh, if and when there's a recovery or, you know, kind of status quo, this gap in sales, you know, however long it is, kind of cleanly flows into closings in five months. How are you guys thinking about that? Thank you. Um, right now, Matthew, I'd, I'd like to stick to our business model. Our margins are higher on our built-to-order sales have been for years, and um, uh, we believe that's the right way to go. And um, I'll never say never because there could be some community somewhere where it makes sense to do that, but right now we'll stick to our, our process and make as much money as we can for us. Okay, got it. Thank you for that. And then I wanted to ask on, on the community side, um, you know, presumably with, with sales centers and models closing and you know, delaying openings in the near term, is, are there any numbers you could put around uh, that, you know, if there's sort of a backlog of, of community openings that might uh, emerge that perhaps would be available to open later in the year? Um, did you, you didn't, we don't know what the... No, but I mean, you know, our, our process is continuing forward on the grand openings. We're not having big grand opening events right. where we're gathering hundreds of people around, you know, balloons and hot dogs, but... We're, uh, we're opening the communities. We're not holding up uh, any, any community openings. There may be other external things that could prevent us from opening, but uh, we're certainly trying to move ahead with the openings and trying to keep the business running. In, in a typical opening, we'll have a, a waiting list or a contact list of several hundred when we get the models completed. So what we're doing is completing the models, uh, merchandising, getting ready to open. We'll staff them. We're doing the same thing with uh, the virtual selling effort and by appointment only, and we would uh, open for sales. We're just not having the big promotional events that we typically do. Our next question comes online of John Lobala with Bank of America. Please see what's your question. Hey guys, thank you for taking my questions here as well. Uh, the, the first one is I'm just curious, you know, how much skin the typical KB buyer has in the game in the sense of, you know, what are they putting down for a down payment? Is that down payment generally refundable? And, you know, maybe if in certain situations the down payment was not refundable in the past, are you guys making exceptions today, kind of given the extenuating circumstances and the pressure on the consumer? Well, if, the, if they can't qualify for a loan down, we always refund the money. If, if uh, we haven't started the home and they change their mind, we'd like to keep them for – another day so you'd refund the money and uh, past that uh, our deposits vary by city and if the home's completed and and um, the loan's approved and they they uh, don't want to perform at this time our first step would be the same pause that we're doing with land sellers we're going to offer them a 30-day 60-day window okay let's call a timeout um, keep everything ready to go, and let's see how the, the world settles. So uh, first step right now is not uh, managing the deposits. It's managing our, our customers and keeping them in the game. Okay, that's helpful. And then you know, understanding that this is going to be project by project and community by community, but is there a rule of thumb that you guys think about you know, where a margin, maybe the gross margin what pricing on a project would have to go in, in order to trigger an impairment on the land? Okay, look, on the impairment side, you know, there's three big factors uh, surrounding it. One is a macroeconomic situation, and what we're seeing right now is completely different than what we saw going in the last downturn, big downturn for housing. It's not financial sector driven. We don't believe we'll see the same level of distressed inventory. We didn't have the easy credit situation, everything else. So I think everything's pointing to a much better um, conditions in the macro. If you look at our land portfolio and the quality of our land portfolio, that's also improved tremendously. Um, we've been pretty cautious with land investments. Um, we're still investing in the best submarkets, relatively modest lot counts. We're staying right down the middle with strategy as far as uh, setting up our communities to be at the low price point, uh, shorter duration land position. So the second component of that, our land portfolio is looking uh, very positive. And then finally, kind of getting to your question, then you start looking at community level performance. And, you know, if you look back over the last 12 month period, our gross margins are right around the 19% range. Um, at that level, there's still quite a bit of room, as you can imagine, before your undiscounted cash flow 
uh, becomes negative. And you know, before we start looking at pricing, we do have other levers available to us. Uh, you know, and, instead of just simply cutting price, we certainly look at the, the size of homes we're building and offering, uh, VABE savings, other cost reduction, revenue adjustment strategies that we could do. So we think we're, we're quite, a way, uh, quite a ways away from that. Uh, we think there's a lot of room on that piece. Um, always a risk, you know, when there's market disruptions, but we believe we're much more favorably positioned than, um, than at any point in the last decade or so as far as making it through this. And uh, we also don't expect to see huge market disruptions that we saw in, in terms of pricing. Our next question comes on the line of Michael Rio with J.P. Morgan. Please, with the question. Thanks. Uh, appreciate it. And I uh, hope everyone is, um, uh, the whole KB team is uh, healthy and safe. Um, the first question I had was uh, maybe just kind of circling back and, and, and talking a little bit about the backlog from another perspective. Um, you know, obviously over the next, you know, month or two, you know, there's going to be dramatic changes in the country with regards to unemployment. And, and you saw the, uh, I'm sure you might have seen the uh, unemployment claims spike uh, uh, today. Um, I, I was just curious if you've, you talked about being perhaps proactive or, or working with different buyers. Um, if, if there's been any, been any initial efforts over the last week or two um, around, you know, reaching out to, you know, whatever percent of backlog it may be um, that, that might be more susceptible to, to some of the employment trends or some of the, the tougher industries being hit right now um, as it relates to, to the shutdowns um, that, are, that are ongoing. And if you have any early sense around, you know, what percent of, of the backlog um, you know, might might be you know kind of in that um, you know susceptible or, or or you know subject to those types of tougher hit industries. Yeah, um, Michael, a couple things come to mind. Um, you know, when you have the headline of the number, and so you try to understand that. If you look in just California, I think the number was 187,000. In the state, so that's a it's a big number, but it's a say with 20 million in employment or something like that. So it's, it's a, a relatively small percentage. And if you think about the the buyer's behavior, um, big purchase, most purchase. We're, we're one of the first calls they make if they've lost their job because they they're disappointed and they know they can't get in, and they either lobby that they'll go get another job and hang in there or whatever. So we, we know pretty quickly if people are have lost employment or if their situation has drastically changed. And it, it's one of the benefits of having a mortgage company partner like we do now with a much higher capture rate. So we, we have a pulse of the, the buyers. And I'm not aware of a, of a way for a, a concern, frankly, that's been raised on an industry or a city where there's a lot of cans, if the, if the unemployment numbers stay at this level for a long period of time, you have to assume that the can rate is going to go up, but we're, we're, not, we're not seeing it yet. It's a daily, weekly thing, and we're being very watchful. Okay, uh, understood. Um, it, it, um, I'm sorry? Um, I guess the uh, second question was just kind of more around um, – um, you know, personnel management and, and kind of a tough question, but, you know, obviously, um, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of the length of this downturn and also the, um, uh, the, the, the ability for the economy to, to bounce back. Um, I, I was just curious if, you know, as you look at your business, uh, certainly – Today, it's pretty premature um, to, you know, think about uh, adjusting staffing levels or anything of that nature, or, or perhaps, uh, um, uh, you know, even furloughing or whatnot. But, you know, are there any thoughts around, you know, if this were to last for another you know, three months, six months, uh, you know, and, and the recovery might be at, 
you know, softer levels given if there's persisting unemployment. I don't mean to be too gloomy, of course, but, you know, just trying to get a sense for the, the flexibility that you might have in, in your personnel, um, you know, be it across the sales centers or the design studios or other parts of the, the fixed cost, fixed cost structure chain. Um, you know, if that's something you've started to give any thought towards. Um, uh, t two opening thoughts. Uh, one, I already shared that the safety and the security of our employees is top priority for us and for me around here. Uh, the, the second top priority for me is a, a very strong desire to maintain the organization that was operating at such a high level 25 days ago. We have a very strong machine here, and it's a credit and a tribute to the employee base. So we're going to do what we, we can to, to retain and uh, motivate and reward the employee base. If it's a uh, short cycle, you just you keep everybody and you go back to work. If this thing extends out for months and months, we've shared that our, um, our build pace and our land pace is tied to our sales pace. So if you're your sales pace six or eight months out, you expect to be off dramatically. You have to do what you can, unfortunately, to to uh, preserve and protect your profitability and your organization. So um, I think it's way too premature to, to go out there. Right now our view is let's, let's uh, maintain this organization that's operating so well and uh, bunker down, cut our overhead where we can, and, and see how things go as, as it starts to settle. Our final question comes from the line of Susan McLear with Goldman Sachs. Please do with the question. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for squeezing me in. My first question is just, can you give us a little bit of color around what you're seeing in your Vegas communities? Um, you know, has anything changed there significantly? And how are you thinking about that market, obviously, given its reliance on tourism and, and travel? Um, but as you know, Susan, Vegas is a top performing business for us, um, big business, and uh, even in March, had good sales. Um, it, it, it's like the comments I just made, to, uh, Michael. We're, we're not seeing a big rash of unemployment yet, or our backlog is still relatively stable. We're closing a lot of houses in Vegas. Uh, it has been flagged because of the industries that are there. Uh, that it's got the potential for more layoffs. Um, um, the city is more diversified than it was, so it's not just casinos anymore. And it's like our other cities we're monitoring. I think it's too early to, to call right now, but uh, that, that team is one of our best at reacting to market conditions, so we'll deal with it as it, as it comes up. Okay, thanks. And then my second question uh, relates a little more broadly. Given the change in, um, in how you're communicating with buyers and, and trying to get buyers through the website and, and traffic such as that, have you made any changes to the marketing strategy or your marketing approach? How are you making sure that you stay top of mind with potential buyers, especially maybe as we think about new community openings and, and not having the same kind of events and the same level of, of maybe, you know, attraction that they otherwise would have had? Well, we, we have shifted almost totally to um, Internet-based advertising. There's very little spend anymore on radio, newspaper, magazine, all the old traditional things that we did over the years. And as, as we've continued to refine and enhance, we know which uh, vehicles online get us the most leads and the most sales. So you're constantly refining your, your spend in online marketing to what you know works. And uh, you do that, you can geofence your traffic so you know the buyer profiles of who's buying in that area. You can target them with your your most effective online outreach and it's working pretty well. So it's a very interesting process right now that we're, we're still learning, but it's gonna make our industry a lot better. We're, we're finally able to use technology to to promote our homes as opposed to a billboard in a newspaper. Okay, thank you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our question and answer session as well as today's conference call. We thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect your lines and have a wonderful day.